Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for your word. We long to grow in grace and knowledge of you. Seal to our hearts that which is truth. Filter out all of that which is not of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. In the last video, we got an inside look at Bema, the judgment seat of Christ. And now we're being told that we are stewards of God's Word, uh, some to a greater degree than others. It's entirely possible that one who is very famous in preaching and teaching the Scriptures is nothing compared to you. What matters is how diligent we are, how honestly we approach this text. There's many charlatans who profess to be stewards of God's mysteries, and we all are stewards, and you are to some degree a, stewards, a, a, a steward of God's Word. You have a stewardship over it, and that is a serious responsibility. I do not want to teach error. I don't think any true Christian wants to. Our text has shown us that it is diligently sought in stewards that they be found faithful. And I believe that's faithful to the Word. And if we really took an inventory, we're probably better stewards uh, uh, than what we might think. Uh, Stewards of God's mysteries. We know that He's given us all truth. Uh, that's mysteries, plural. And that He's given us all things. I've spent some time talking about that. Everything, dearly beloved, that touches your life is a gift from God. James tells us to count it all joy when we fall into various trials, temptations. Uh, the word is testing. God tests our faith. And I find very few Christians who count it all joy when they fall into testing. God says we are stewards of His mysteries, that is, His Word. And we saw that Paul said that it is of no consequence that I should be judged of you. In fact, I don't even examine myself. The word there is examine. And now we can launch into you know an hour study about Paul and Paul's condition. And, and how he looked at himself as he wrote to the Corinthians. You know, our emphasis, our focus is all on Paul, his feelings, his emotions, his logic, his, his reasoning. And I'm not saying that Paul is not the, the writer of this epistle, but he's not the author. I think that when we focus on Paul as the author of this epistle, rather than the Holy Spirit, then we fail to fully grasp that or to consider, you know, what this, the message that he's trying to convey. And that this message is for us, not just the Corinthians. Uh, you know, we're, uh, if, if you just look at it as Paul, well, it's just a little bit of history. It's 2,000 years old. You know, I guess we could make an application, you know, that, uh, that boy, the way that they treated Paul is maybe, you know, the way that Christians will treat you, but, I do not think, dearly beloved, that that's the heart of the message at all. This is the Holy Spirit's message to us. This is God's Word. And it's for us. And to some degree, you are a steward of God's mysteries, of, His, of God's revelation. Uh, I do not believe, I've never believed, that we are commanded anywhere in Scripture to persuade people that if they do this, that, or the other thing, that they will miraculously, supernaturally become born again by God from above. You know, and they'll become born again by what they did. I am opposed to any minister who preaches 
to some unredeemed individual that he's got to do something at and and note it's it's you know it's it's at that person's timing you know when they decide they need to be redeemed or when the person decides they need to be redeemed you know because someone who's redeemed uh uh he's uh, or or preaching to someone you know that, that's well you know this poor guy that got drunk you know he just needs to be redeemed that is not proclaiming the word of god that's not the purpose of this book this is the revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. We should be a faithful steward of His Word. We're building on that one foundation, which is Christ. When we looked at verse 3, it, it is a, Paul says, it's a very small thing, very minute thing that I should be judged of you. I, I still insist this is the Holy Spirit's Word to you and, and me that God is telling you that it's a very small thing that you would be judged by any congregation or any group of Christian people or any individual Christian for that matter. You know, and folks, it's so easy just to put this all on Paul, you know, but if we do that, then we really haven't learned anything really except how that the people at Corinth treated Paul. You know, that's, that's all we know. That was 2,000 years ago. And, you know, and we'd like not to be treated that way. And, and folks, I, I don't believe that that is a correct application of the text. We even have this St. Paul declaring that you received the Word of God from us, which is truth. God's Word. That's God's Word. That's not Paul's Word. So the application is for us. It is of little consequence that you're judged by others. Uh, Paul, on, his, on a, his way to Damascus, that his conversion, think about that. The judgment of Paul then would have been of little consequence. It could be that their judgment is right. Maybe you're not doing a proper job. Maybe your testimony of the Word of God is not truth. We know that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Oh, there's that awful word, doctrine. For reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That is not judging your brother. Okay, let's make that clear. You won't find the word judgment there in that verse. The one that is judging us is God. And imagine you having judged Paul prior to his Damascus road conversion. You might preach that it's entirely up to man to redeem himself by some action on his part. You know, if he makes the right decision... You know, then he can go to hell, heaven. If he doesn't make the right decision, well, then, you know, we, you, we know where he's going to go. Uh, it's all man. The focus is on men, okay? Man is in control, not God. We've seen God's sovereignty all throughout this, this text. You know, in fact, God would like to be in control, but He isn't. You know, he's, God has actually decreed that you're in control and, and folks, that's nonsense. There's no Scripture like that anywhere in the Word of God. No Scripture like that exists. Someone may judge you on that. However, the consequence is not them judging you as much as God judging you. And we, we have nothing to do with the great white throne judgment. Okay? The text is saying that we shouldn't be much concerned about judgment from others. You know, some of it may be good, but usually most of it isn't. We just got through looking at our judgment, which is separate from the great white throne judgment. Actually, you and I are not well qualified to judge another Christian. We're just not that well qualified. You know, many a Christian is being hammered out by God. 
And you're seeing only what you see at the moment, but you can't see the end result, folks. You cannot see the end result. You really don't know what God is doing in the life of that individual. You know, if you were a dedicated believer in Jesus Christ at the time of Paul, you'd have been totally opposed to Paul. You'd have probably wanted to kill him before he killed more Christians. But, you know, you would have been wrong. God wasn't through with Paul yet. I'm pretty much of the persuasion that Paul was at least 50 years old, if not older, when he had his Damascus Road experience. We haven't yet gone through the epistle to the Galatians, but when we study through Galatians, we see in Galatians how that they couldn't believe that he who persecuted the church in time past now preaches the faith, faith which he once tried to destroy. So, man's judgment is not very important. I'm, that's the point I'm trying to push here. Man's judgment is not very important. Neither is a human court. Can you imagine what that must have meant to Paul? An innocent man beheaded by the Roman government. And I'm absolutely positive that Paul realized that all things were his. You know, you could argue that that was his fault. He appealed to Rome, but I believe God directed him to do that. God directs our steps. You know, you might lose your head, as Paul did. You might lose your job. You might lose your family. You might... You may be cast into prison, but if it's a human court judging you concerning God's mysteries, it's of no cons consequence. Does God cease to be God when you're in the lion's den? You know, folks, I really try to count it all joy. I'm sure many of you do too. You know, even when I'm not acting like it, even when I'm not feeling well, when I, when I don't feel like it, you know, Sue, she, she'll think I'm not counting it all joy when I really am. You know, I do believe that, that the, those testings are a gift from God. I do, I do believe that they're good for me. And I do not believe that they're pleasant. So I work at counting it all joy. But I do not judge myself. I do not examine myself. And again, this is, it's, Paul is writing this, but, but it's the Holy Spirit telling us this. And Paul is an example to us. This is God's Word to us. I do not judge my own self. Well, I suppose you could argue, well, that doesn't make any sense. How does he know he doesn't judge himself unless he, he judged him? you know, uh, himself, uh, or judge himself, unless he judged that he hadn't judged himself. If you want to go down that road of that, that nonsense, you know, you're welcome to, but I can't do that. You can wrestle with that insane logic as long as you want. I believe that the text is saying that in what I know, I am convinced that I am being faithful to God's Word. That's what I'm, I'm persuaded to believe. Now, I may not be. The text is not saying that I'm absolutely faithful to the Word of God. That's not what the text is saying at all. But the text is saying, I think I am. Paul says, I think I am. I don't have anything against myself. And folks, I'm thrilled with that. You know, I think I'm trying my best in hours of study to be, to be faithful and diligent, to be honest with the text, to be faithful in my stewardship with God's mysteries, that is God's Word. You know, the, the word mystery meaning something that God has revealed, and that's His Word. There are uh, people that... Uh, I know who disagree with some of the stuff or all of the stuff that I say. And I try to consider that disagreement. 
But as far as I am concerned, I have a clear conscience in what I'm teaching. Okay? But I do not by that mean that I have a clear conscience in that uh, I have done everything in the world possible, everything humanly possible to prepare to give a message or to, to prepare for a, for a, a sermon. Uh, I've tried. I spend a lot of time in this book. You know, but uh, I'm getting to be an old man and, and I have to, you know, entertain, you know, my dogs. Anyway, that's, that's beside the point. I know that I could be a much better steward in preparation and study and in language and in time, you know, redeeming my time. I know that. But as far as I'm concerned, I don't know anything against myself in teaching God's Word. I believe that is the thought that the Holy Spirit's trying to convey through Paul. You know, some say that I'm teaching error. I don't want to teach error. I'm not suggesting that I don't teach error because I don't think any man has a handle on the truth. I do not think that any man knows all truth. But I don't judge myself in that. I don't know of anything against myself. Now, you know, you can say, well, you know, that's Paul, you know, and, and it would be so nice if we were all like Paul. And folks, immediately, immediately, you've destroyed the verse, in my opinion. You know, it has no meaning to you. No way in the world could you ever be like Paul. You know, what an apostle he was. This is, our, this is how we think, you know. You know, we got Moses, we got Daniel, we got Paul, you know, just to name a few. You know, those were, those were exceptional Christians. You know, we could never be like them. You know, and so all the verse is really telling us here is that Paul was a hero and, and there's... Uh, there's no message to you in that verse except that Paul's a really great guy. Is that all the text says? I know of people who are, are so burdened with the guilt of sin that they are just devastated. You know, we're all sinners. Every one of you, every one of you listening to me is a sinner. I don't care who you are. Okay? And we all deserve help. All of us. You know, I've, I've had people write, write me and they've, you know, saying, well, you know, they're the black sheep of the family. You know, those hidden things of darkness are in our hearts. Okay? And, you know, and, and people say, Steve, you just don't know what I've done. You don't, you don't, you don't want to know what I've done. Well, you're right. I don't want to know. I know what Jesus Christ has done with your sin. I know what the, the works of your flesh are. I don't need you to tell me that. You know, most of us are quite aware. The adultery, fornication, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, and so on and on and on. I know that full well myself. Okay, I don't need you to tell me. You know, I know it because I read it. I know it because I, I live it. Because I have an old man. I deserve hell. There's no doubt about it. You know, I can't give God any argument. You know, he'd be absolutely right. I'm not going to ever argue with God because he'll always win. My point is, there are so many hurting, despondent Christians more than ever that I've ever seen. Okay, today. People, I'm talking about people for whom Christ died. You know, people who say, well, I, you know, I could never serve Him. I'm so filthy. You know, there's no way that I could ever really be of any true service to God. You, Steve, you just don't know what I've done. And I don't really, I don't want to know what you've done. 
It is not me that needs to know what you've done, but it might be you. It could just very well possibly be you that needs to know what Christ did for you. You know, folks, if we live under the guilt of that sin, you know, aren't we really calling God a liar? I mean, hasn't He perfected you forever? Or, or was that only Paul and, and Moses and, you know, and Daniel and, you know, just go down the list. By one offering He has perfected forever those whom He set apart. And we saw that we were set apart right, right at the beginning of this epistle. He sets you apart. So, you know, you can grovel in the mess of your, of your old rotten, filthy, sinful old man, you know, life, your old flesh, or you can rejoice in the fact that you're perfected forever. God did not do anything for your old man, all right? He didn't set about to clean up the flesh. You know, it just died. He redeemed you and made you a new creation in Christ Jesus, and that new creation is perfect. We saw that when we went through the first epistle, first John. That new creation is holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. That's how you stand before God, without fault, without blame. You know, I had one person say to me, Well, you know, the reason you say that uh, is, is, well, you just haven't sinned like I have. Well, I guess that guy's got some special old man, I guess, that's, that's different than mine, that, that knows really more about sinning than, than my old man does. No, no, no. No. Could be the reason is they, they simply don't believe what God has said. Does God work in your life to will and, and do of His good pleasure? Does He? Does He or does He not? Or is, that, or is that only in Paul or somebody that you think is good? Does God direct your steps? Well, He directs everyone's but yours. You know, does He know the way that you take? Does He work all things together for your good? Or is that just true of other Christians, not, not yourself? Are these things true? Or is God a liar? I don't know anything against myself. I believe the text is saying, if we are faithful stewards of God's mysteries, of God's Word, faithful in handling God's Word, then we ought to be able to say, we don't know anything that we're doing wrong in that. You know, I've, I've told other pastors these things in the past. You know, one said, unbelievably, one of them told me, well, I believe all that, Steve, I truly do, but if I really preached God's sovereignty, I'd lose half my congregation. Well, great, get rid of the dead wood. You know, that'd be marvelous. Numbers folks, don't mean a single thing in, in, what, in what we're doing here, okay? If you seriously teach, you know, a sovereign God who knows the end from the beginning, you know, alpha, the Alpha and the Omega, who, who works in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure, you know, that He's God, a very God, the supreme, majestic God of all creation. Folks, you won't have a huge church. You, you just won't, okay? Most Christians don't want to hear the word. They don't even want to hear the phrase, God is sovereign. You know, they don't want to hear the word doctrine. They don't want to hear sovereign. You know, what, what they want is to be the captain of their own ship. They want to control their own destiny, okay? They want to believe that they must do something to appease an angry God. They want they got to do something to please God. And they'll accept that message. They, they have itching ears. And so, you know, some ministers have, have actually told me, believe it or not, they've actually told me that, that they are teaching what they know to be error. And, you know, what a ghastly statement to make. 
Dearly beloved, I do not have any argument with the Arminian who really, really, truly believes what he's teaching. But, you know, to imagine somebody who believes firmly in the sovereignty of God and won't teach it because, you know, for whatever reason, because his congregation is, is not yet able to handle it or, or I can't teach it because, you know, if I did, my wife would leave me. You know, I'd be a single pastor or, you know. They just can't handle it, you know. Folks, that's hard for me to believe. I couldn't do that. You know, that man must know something against himself. I know nothing against myself, says Paul. And I have pointed out repeatedly over the, over the past several years, this book is not an instruction book on how to live the Christian life. It is primarily the revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ, that one foundation. Not the work of a man, not the work of a human, not begging somebody to do something so that you know, they'll go to heaven. Oh, we got to get them saved. Or, or they'll, they'll go to hell. You know, imagine a noted evangelist saying, there were three people, okay, three people who were convicted. They were convicted. They wanted to come down. They wanted to accept Christ. But, you know, three teenagers were making fun of them and, and got in their way. So they went out and driving home, they were killed in a car wreck. And went to hell. There's three people, okay? Three people who could have gone to heaven. Now, now they went to hell. Dearly beloved, you believe that trash? We are lost sheep that he, he finds. Can you possibly believe that that is God's Word? That that's what we've been looking at? You know, there were three of God's children who really wanted to accept Him and they died in a car wreck and went to hell. And I think, my Lord, you know, what is being taught in churches today? I don't know anything against myself, says Paul. But even though that's true, that doesn't declare me to be righteous. Says our, says our text. Does that mean that I'm teaching what this book says? Not necessarily. That does not mean that I'm righteous in my teaching. I'm righteous because Jesus Christ died in my place. I've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. So have you. But here we are dealing with stewardship. Am I, am, I, am I justified in my stewardship because I don't know a single thing against myself? No, 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 I'm not. And, and that word no, there is a perfect tense. Perfect tense, which indicates a complete understanding of what I'm doing as a, as a steward of God's Word. The question, folks, is have I given enough diligence and study to make sure that I can, I can make that no a perfect tense? Now, to the best of my knowledge, to the best I know, I'm doing the best I can in my study and in my handling of, of God's Word. I, I'm really, really trying. I really am. And I do, I do not want to handle this text deceitfully, okay? But that doesn't make me righteous as far as handling the Word of God is concerned. <coughs> it just doesn't make me righteous. I'm already righteous in Christ. And He that judges me is the Lord, okay? And that's what I look forward to. That's what I look forward to. There's not going to be any, you know, that's where the hours of study and diligence in the Word of God are going to be made apparent. Not the great white throne judgment, which, you know, we might be a spectator, but we're not a participant in that. 
You know, it's really easy to spend a couple of hours watching a movie, but, you know, a couple of hours in serious Bible study? I mean, that's hard work. And God's going to take that inventory. And I, I, I can tell you, I'm, I'm concerned about it. You know, I don't know whether you are or not. I'm extremely concerned about it. I, you know, and people say, Steve, you don't ever preach responsibility. That's ridiculous. I want to do the best I can in handling God's mysteries as one of His stewards. That's what I want to do. Now, if you read commentaries, uh, there's a number of them uh, on 1 Corinthians. You know, the word Paul is, is, is focused on repeatedly. You know, it's Paul this and Paul that. And this is what Paul thought. And this is what Paul said. And, you know, folks, Paul is not the author of this epistle. That may seem like a minor, you know, detail, but it is not. He's not the author. God is. Verse 6. Verse 6. That was too long an introduction. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. Okay? Men. You know, this is a... It's interesting. Men. Don't be puffed up one against another. And so, and so we are now looking at Paul's logic, right? We're looking at Paul's reasoning. No. It's the Word of God. Paul wrote this epistle to the Corinthians, but he didn't author it. And I'm sorry if, you, if, if you're tired of hearing me. Steve, Steve you're just repeating yourself. I'm, I'm, I, it's that important, folks. He didn't author the epistle. The author of these words is not Paul. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, says not Paul, says these things, brethren. Okay? Brethren. Now, think of it. God calls you brethren. Y'all remember that passage of Scripture? He's not ashamed to call us brethren. Think about that. And we, and we, we tend to rush past that word without giving it much thought. You know. you know, despite all the flesh, all the filthiness of the old man, he calls us brethren. All right? Probably shouldn't, but, but he does. He tells me he loves me with a love that never changes. He loves me the same today as he loved me yesterday. He loves me the same today as he loved me when he died in my place or, or, or before I was ever conceived or, or before he chose me. Before the foundation of the world, He loved me. God loved you before the world was ever created. These things, brethren, the, these are God's words to us. Okay. The Holy Spirit has transferred these things to Paul and Apollos for the Corinthians' sake. Transferred these things to Paul and Apollos. Well, at least the Corinthians, right? Uh, folks, if we are fair, if we're fair in uh, calling this God's Word, not Paul's, then th this Scripture is profitable to us for reproof, for doctrine, for instruction and in righteousness. And so, it's been transferred to Paul and Apollos for our sake as well as those at Corinth. That's pretty much a no-brainer, I think. But I think the, the, the point should be emphasized. In order that I might learn, you might learn, not to think of men above that which has been written. Above that which has been written. What is that? What, what's that? You know, we can, uh, I guess we can do a lot of guessing here, but I, I believe for a fact that, that Bible study and biblical research are two different things. You know, it's one thing to study the text. It's another thing to do research, historical research. Uh, I was taught in Bible college that if you're going to study this verse, 
you know, well, you got to do a literature search of, of the old Jewish writers. In fact, all of the all the literature you can find, basically, uh, from the first century, first, second, third, fourth centuries. You know, now, folks, that's a lot of research. That's a lot of reading. And I was told all that, and and I hadn't studied one verse of scripture. And somehow, that idea bothered me. You know, that, that everything that they were asking me to do was actually, in a very real way, it was directing me away from studying this book. You know, I was, I was taught, in fact, I was warned, okay? If, Steve, if you depart from the beaten path, well, I mean, you know, you, know, you ought to be careful what you're teaching. You should be really careful about what you're teaching. Don't stray from the, from the beaten path. And, and, and I'll, I told my instructors then, and I'll tell you now, that my problem has been trying to determine what the beaten path is. What is the beaten path? You know, am I, am I going to learn that from extra biblical writings? You know, I found myself having to disagree with much of what many others considered that well-beaten path, that well-traveled road. You know, so that ought to raise a red flag. Folks, I know that what I teach doesn't often make any sense to people because it doesn't appear to be that, that well-worn path. And so pages and, and pages and pages are are written in sermons after sermon after sermon is preached trying to figure out what Paul was talking about. Okay? And now we're back to Paul. <laughs> you know, he, Paul must, he really must have scoured the Old Testament Scriptures. You know, probably, he probably used the Septuagint. You know, he did all this research, all this reading. He, he hunted, he ran to and fro, you know, looking for you know, and people come up with all kinds of verses that he might have been referring to, you know, that really don't, they don't sound at all like this verse. You know, well, he, he picked some, he, he picked some verses out of Proverbs or he picked some out of the Psalms or, or someplace else, you know, where God seems to infer that you shouldn't think highly of men. And maybe that's the case. But I'm going to suggest I'm gonna, I'm gonna, that the words don't, don't go above that which has been written. I, I'm going to suggest that that's what we're reading right here. That's what's written. That's what we're studying. Now, I don't know if that takes me off the beaten path or not. That's just, that's, that's what I, th I believe we're looking at. Paul was ordained to fulfill or complete the Word of God. God's using him for that. Sure, Paul's doing the writing, but it's God's Word. Paul's not, to, he's not completing his own Word. He's completing God's Word. You know, and then I, I'm, I'm reminded of Peter, you know, saying that, you know, uh, even as our beloved brother Paul, uh, you know, according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. No, I, I think the... the I think it's what we're looking at right here. Couldn't be any more clear to me. I, now I I could be wrong, but that's that's I'm gonna that's I'm gonna stick with that. Peter considered what Paul wrote to be scripture. So so do I. And so the exhortation of the Holy Spirit is that you don't go beyond and think of men above that which has been written. And what has been written is what we're looking at. Paul planted, Apollos watered, and God gave the increase. 
So you shouldn't look at men above what's been written. And what has been written is exactly, I believe, what we've been studying. It's exactly what we're looking at right here. And so, you know, you don't have to go uh, around hunting in, in the Septuagint or in the writings, but, you know, of Josephus or the writings of, of this person or that person between so the writings between the Testaments to try to come up with what Paul was referring to. Paul wasn't referring to anything except what he was, except the Word of God. The Holy Spirit was referring to His Word. That's what He's given us. We shouldn't think of men above that which is written or will be puffed up. Uh, most people understand that to mean you know, pride. And now we come to, to three very serious questions. Who made you to differ from another? Okay, verse 7. Who made you to differ from another? That's the first question. Now, if anybody made you to differ from another, it had to be God. It surely wasn't you. It surely wasn't Paul. It surely wasn't Apollos. Who made you different or to differ from another? Second question. What do you have that you weren't given or that you didn't receive? Okay. Now we just looked at all things are yours. And I, I spoke a little bit on that. Uh, I don't want to kind of rehash that. You know, you don't have anything that, that God hasn't given you. The hair on your head, the, the, or, or no hair on your head. You know, The body in which you live, your wife, your, your husband, your, your kids, you know, the, the, the town that you live in, your, your job, your health, the list goes on and on. What do you have that wasn't given to you by God? But I don't think that we're just looking at physical, material things here, okay? I think it, we, we would be wrong if we didn't include the spiritual things. I don't think it's just referring to just material, physical things, but spiritual things. And in fact, I, I'm going to suggest... First and foremost, He gave you His Word. He gave you your faith. He gave you your new creation in Christ Jesus. In fact, every spiritual blessing in Christ, and, and I'll even say including your level of, that level of spiritual discernment and maturity which you possess at any given moment. Okay, You are what God has given you. Third question. Now, if you did receive it, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? If you received it, why do you boast as though you hadn't received it? As though you, as though you did it yourself. Okay? And, and dearly beloved, those are fabulous questions that ought to bring us to the realization the solid realization that we are looking at the sovereign, almighty God. At the end of the third chapter, we saw that all things are ours. Everything that you have, God gave you. Everything. There's nothing that you have that God didn't give you, including the ingrown toenail. Okay, and Folks, why can't we rejoice in that? Most of the Christians I know don't rejoice in the fact that trials and hardships are meant to have a purpose. They're meant to grow us in grace and knowledge of Christ. That they are a gift from God. That all things, every single thing is working together for their good. We ought to be rejoicing with joy unspeakable. But we don't seem to see that in a lot of Christians oftentimes don't see it in our own lives. 
Verse 8. Now ye are full. Now you're rich. You have reigned as kings without us. And I would to God you did reign that we also might reign with you. And uh, now you're satisfied. The word is, is satiated, satisfied. It's a present passive. You are being satisfied. You are at the present time rich. You have reigned as kings. That is, those who have dominion. The word there means you have dominion. And you did that separate from us, says the Holy Spirit, not Paul. You did that separate from us. And I would to God you did reign that we might also reign with you. You know, it's so easy to say there, there are certain things that you wouldn't do because you love the Lord. You know, and, and, and somebody else doesn't. And so now you've exalted yourself. You reign, folks, as kings. I don't believe that Paul is... We're looking at sarcasm here through this. You reign as kings, the Holy Spirit says to the Corinthians. You look at the whole world and man... You know, and I, I, I tell you, just take a step back, folks. You look at the whole Christian world. Yo, man, we got to be right up there at the top. Top 2%, right? I mean, if anybody's going to heaven, it's got to be people at, at Blessed Hope Forever, right? I mean, I mean them, them other folks, they just, they just really just don't love the Lord like we do. You know, and so what do we do? We look down on them. We look down on them. Keep in mind, this is the Corinthians the Holy Spirit is speaking to. Now ye are full. The Word is satisfied. I believe the Holy Spirit, not Paul, is saying that, that these things are true. You reign as kings. But they, they're not living like it. They're not living that way. Because if they were, then they would also be reigning with Paul and Apollos. Okay? I mean, the, the inference clearly is you're not acting like you are. Okay? You're not acting like you're reigning. But I believe they were. I'm going to suggest that they were. Why? Because of what they did? No. But because of what Christ did. And God was just not through with these Corinthians yet. Verse 9. And I'm kind of running over time here, but I want to try to at least go take a look at this. For I think that God has set forth us the apostles last as it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. Okay? Appointed to death. Alright? I believe that's talking about death to sin, self, the law. Did you know we died to, to six things? Sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and death itself. Okay? Now you tell someone that you've died to sin, self, and the law, they'll think you're an idiot. They'll think you're a fool. I'm talking about Christians here. It sounds like Paul is saying that, that he and Apollos, not the Corinthians, and not a, not, that can't be us, but no, I think it is the Corinthians. I think it's us. It was true. What's true of Paul, Apollos, the Corinthians is true of us. Okay? The point being that this is how we ought to live. God has so blessed you, dearly beloved, beyond measure beyond comprehension. You've been crucified with Christ. You died daily in order that others may live. Die. What do you mean? What does that mean? You died to self. Okay? Unless we've died to the law, we cannot bear fruit unto God, and yet the world says that it's by the law that we bear fruit unto God. Dearly beloved, we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. Well, look, I'm out of time. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. And until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.